Okay, good morning for joining us for today's webinar, Screening for Adverse Challenges in the Pediatric Primary Care Setting, Practical Considerations and Lessons Learned. My name is Lara Altman, and I'm the Adverse Childhood Experiences Program at Health and Medicine Research Group. Um, before I turn it over, our esteemed of background information um, about our organization, as well as some logistical information about the webinar. Health and Medicine Policy Research to improve the health of all people in Illinois by promoting health equity. And you can find more information um, about our work and our organization at Oh, I should add that we are live tweeting this um, today. The hashtag is ILACES. Feel free um, to join in. Health and Medicine Policy Research Group is the lead convener of the Illinois ACES Response Collaborative, um, which is a disciplinary group that utilizes the science of ACES and childhood trauma in an effort to create critical transformation to policy and practice aligned with current research. The the power of systems level cooperation to intervene in the transmission of ACEs from one generation to the next. And our many successes have been grounded in a commitment to a collective impact, recognizing that no single organization or sector can build community resilience alone. The collaborative brings together leaders from different groups to think more broadly about ACEs and by coordinating our varied efforts to affect the dial. Um, you can visit our website, and the link for the Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative is at the bottom of this slide, um, where you can find including policy briefs um, and an environmental scan and other resources. The collaborative would like to thank the United Way of Metropolitan Chicago for its partnership in this work, as well as uh, the following fund medical work, which include the Illinois Foundation, Crown Family Philanthropies, the Otho S. Memorial Intelligent Community initiative. All participants are muted, so to submit questions, please type your questions in the question box on the right side um, of your screen. You can at any point, um, and, and um, we will have some time at the end to um, answer your questions. After the webinar, you'll receive an email with a short evaluation survey, which we'd really appreciate if you could fill out, ways to participate Response Collaborative, um, a link to our website, um, uh, uh, some contact information for everyone involved today. We are excited to have Dr. Kavita Selvaraj joining us today. Um, she is a pediatric weight management specialist trained in clinical medicine, research, teaching, and she obtained her bachelor's degree and after college, she taught seventh grade health in an underserved neighborhood through Teach for America in Los Angeles, where she earned a Master of Arts degree in secondary science education from Lloyd University. She did medical school at the University of Chicago, her pediatrics residency at the Children's Hospital of Chicago, and a Master of Public Health degree from Northwestern University. Um, she is currently the Chief Fellow of Pediatrics and primary care at Lurie, and an instructor of pediatrics at the Northwestern University. Fine. She's also double board certified um, and obesity medicine. Her research involves screening for adverse childhood experiences and social determinants of health in the pediatric, as well as um, improving the quality of children with severe obesity attending subspecialty clinics. So we are very excited that she is. Here. We also have Dr. Audrey Stillerman and Dr. Be chiming in and adding some. Now, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Selvaraj. So, um, perfect. We'll make you the presenter. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. All right, so good morning, and thanks for that lovely introduction, Lara. Uh, my name is Dr. Kavita Selvaraj, as Lara said, and it's my pleasure to be speaking to you today about an issue that's near and dear to my heart, um, adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, as we'll refer to them for the rest of this talk. I'm joined today by two of my favorite people, my colleagues, Dr. Audrey Silliman and Dr. Stan Sonu, who I'll introduce further in a moment. And to those of you who are joining us on this 9 a.m. Friday call, clearly this is a topic near and dear to your hearts as well, so thank you for spending part of your morning with us. 
We have lots of experience with ACEs screening that we're going to share with you today, but none of us claim to be experts or know the perfect way to do this. So we hope this webinar sparks further offline conversations that incorporate the wisdom that many of you out there have collected on this topic as well. We have nothing to disclose. So after we introduce ourselves a bit further, we'll discuss the rationale for and against ACEs screening in the pediatric primary care setting. And then we'll describe our attempts to address these issues in our Ask Questions for Health study, uh, which is a massive Chicago-wide screening effort. We'll share some of the many lessons we learned from our collaborative screening experience, and we'll discuss the practical issues to consider if you are thinking of starting an ACEs screening program, whether that's in a doctor's office, a school, or another setting. Uh, we'll wrap up by sharing our thoughts on the future of ACEs screening and identifying areas for multidisciplinary collaboration. Um, since we're spending the next hour together, we'll begin by telling you a little bit of ourselves and how we got here. I've personally actually always found it interesting to find out how other people discovered the field of ACEs, so I thought we'd start by adding our stories here. So I think you got my general bio already, so I'll just skip to how I got here. So I discovered the world of ACEs very gradually over the course of the past 16 years. I went to college at U of C where I got my bachelor's in biology, and I actually spent those four years as a state-certified sexual assault crisis counselor. Um, on the South and West sides, and then later became a state certified domestic violence crisis counselor for immigrant women on the North side. Um, and in these roles, I worked with women and children who are often going through the worst period of their lives. And it was my expo first exposure to ACEs and toxic stress, even though I didn't know that there were terms for those things. Um, when I moved to California to teach, um, I First of all, I learned how to teach with my master's program, but really what I learned was more about ACEs, uh, watching my students deal with neighborhood violence, poverty, unstable home situations, found that I really liked working with kids, so I came back to Chicago for med school and residency. Uh, I learned about ACEs on our residency advocation, uh, advocacy rotation with Dr. Barbara Bailden, who's my mentor, and that opened up to the whole new career path for me. I was lucky enough to stay on for a fellowship here at Lurie, um, and I've been spending my time here uh, working with all of these fine people on how to screen for and treat child ACEs in pediatric uh, primary care. So speaking of Audrey, I'd like to formally introduce Dr. Audrey Stilliman. Uh, she's a double board certified physician in family medicine and integrative medicine. Audrey's a clinical assistant professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago, where she also serves as the associate director of medical affairs at the Office of Community Engagement and Neighborhood Health Partnerships. If you'd like to hear more about Audrey's interest in ACEs, please watch her awesome TEDx talk linked here. Audrey, do you want to say hi or add anything that I missed in your intro? Yeah, I'll just say hello. Thanks, Kavita, and um, I really appreciate being able to participate this morning. All right, thanks, Audrey. And we're also lucky to have Dr. Stan Sony joining us today. Stan is a double board certified physician in internal medicine and pediatrics. He had seen his MD at the Medical College of Georgia, did his residency and chief residency here at, um, in Chicago at Rush, and is about to finish up his preventive medicine fellowship at Cook County and get his MPH from Northwestern. Stan also shares his interest in ACEs in a re recent TEDx talk linked here, uh, which makes me the only speaker here today who does not have a TEDx talk to share with you. Um, but I'll get working on that at some point. Um, but in the meantime, Stan, do you want to say hi and add anything that I missed? Uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Thanks for this uh, opportunity. All right. Thanks, Stan. So now that you know who we are and how we got here, let's talk about why physicians should screen children for ACEs during their well-child checkups. So the term ACEs comes from a large study that we all know and love at this point. Uh, the original ACEs study took place 20 years ago, asked 17,000 adults about two things childhood trauma and um, current health. So for childhood trauma, they asked about 10 stressors divided into abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction, which includes parental mental illness or substance abuse, having an incarcerated relative, being the mother treated violently, and parental divorce. So despite this being a relatively low risk group, mostly Caucasians and so higher socioeconomic status, they still found that two thirds of these adults had experienced at least one of these 10 ACEs. And sadly, 12% had experienced four or more. So this is very prevalent. Um, the second part of the CDC survey linked the number of ACEs or their ACE score to health outcomes. And what they found was the higher your ACE score, the higher your risk for having major public health problems in adulthood like heart attacks, cancer, and drug abuse. They even found that people with six or more ACEs has a 20-year decrease in their lifespan, which is obviously of interest to us as physicians. So that's the data in adults, which I presume that many of you are familiar with already. Um, but people tend to be less familiar about ACEs data in children, so let's talk about that. So interestingly, we actually have child ACE data from almost 100,000 families from the National Survey of Children's Health in 2011 and 2012. The blue bars here show that a third of U.S. children have experienced one to two ACEs, 
and nearly 10% of kids have had three or more ACEs. That means that about half of our kids have experienced at least one ACE, which is an enormous public health burden. The orange bars show the number in Illinois, which may be a tiny bit better than the national rates, but still very concerning. So I showed you that ACEs can lead to major health problems in adults, but do ACEs cause problems in children? The answer is a resounding yes. So the list on the right shows just some of the child health problems related to ACEs, like obesity, developmental delay, and teen pregnancy. Toxic stress is the final common pathway of untreated ACEs. Um, and so what does this look like in babies, kids, or teenagers? Uh, the short answer is it looks like anything and everything. So abnormal eating and sleeping, developmental delay, bedwetting, attention problems, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, teen pregnancy, uncontrolled asthma. It literally mimics or overlaps with everything that we see in general pediatrics. What we think is that um, what we think might be ADHD or migraines may actually be toxic stress. Uh, and if a kid comes in with a stomach ache, you can throw all the antacids you want at them, but that stomach ache will never go away if the trigger for the stomach ache is when that child witnesses his mother being abused. So we can't just treat the symptom, we have to treat the underlying root cause, and we can't treat the root cause if we don't ask about ACEs. So you'll see that we're arguing that asking about and treating ACEs in childhood are becoming core responsibilities of physicians who care for children. So why should we ask families these very sensitive and personal questions? Uh, one reason is because children do better the earlier we identify and treat the underlying stressor, just like for developmental delay. And this is good news. So this pyramid model from the CDC is an evidence-based model of how ACEs can lead to disease and death. Um, brain imaging studies actually show that children with ACEs may have structural brain problems that disrupt neurodevelopment. And in other words, ACEs can actually lead to abnormal brain development in children, which is kind of terrifying. Their developing baby brains literally absorb the stress, which can cause long-term damage to their neurologic and immune systems. For example, because of this disrupted neurodevelopment, some children with ACEs might be wired to react to a tiny stressor with a giant behavioral outburst. When I was a teacher, I had a student who forgot his pencil at home and threw a chair across the room which is a rather disproportionate reaction to forgetting your pencil. But when you're constantly living under stress, the brain has difficulty differentiating what's normal stress and what's toxic stress, and it might just treat everything like a major threat. When brain development's disrupted and the immune system's on overdrive, kids may have a social, emotional, or cognitive impairment, and that can make it more likely for them to adopt unhealthy behaviors, develop disease, or even die early. So luckily, there is hope. Um, I lost my place for a second here. So um, not every child with ACEs at the bottom of the pyramid will go on to have those poor health outcomes at the top of the pyramid. Research suggests that identifying ACEs early can interrupt this pathway. Um, and if we help families build resiliency, positive parenting, and community resources for all, we can reduce some of that burden. Our governing body of pediatricians, the American Academy of Pediatrics, endorses routine screening of risk factors for toxic stress like ACEs that are common to our patient population. So screening for ACEs in kids should seem to be a pretty straightforward recommendation. But of course, nothing in life is straightforward, and ACEs screening is not an exception. There's a lot of controversy in the medical field about whether ACEs screening causes more good than harm, and there's some valid points to consider, which I'll walk you through. So let's start at the beginning. So back in the 1960s, the World Health Organization laid out 10 principles for screening, and they're actually still quite relevant to the issues of ACEs screening. A few of these points in green favor ACEs screening. For example, we know ACEs are an important health problem. There is an early stage we can intervene on, and we sort of understand the disease progression. However, there are some things in yellow that we just don't have evidence for, like if patients find the screening acceptable or if it's cost effective. And unfortunately, there's a number of factors that argue against ACEs screening. We do not have a perfect screening tool to identify child ACEs. We don't really know who needs treatment if they do have an ACE. There is no widely accepted evidence-based treatment yet, and we don't have easy access to treatment programs. So these 10 WHO uh, screening recommendations can be nicely summarized by Arvind Garg, a pediatrician leader in screening for social determinants of health, um, which is a topic similar to ACEs. And he writes that screening for any condition without the capacity to ensure referral and linkage to appropriate treatment is ineffective and arguably unethical. Um, and if you're interested in hearing more about this, uh, Arjur is mentioning that the journal Academic Pediatrics had a recent issue back in the fall diverted to the controversy of this. So please check that out. So let's flesh out these arguments against screening using a recent article by David Finkelhor, who's a researcher who specializes in child maltreatment. 
So Finkel Hoare outlines three major arguments for why we should not be screening kids for ACEs just yet, um, which we'll summarize here. So first, we don't exactly know what to screen for yet. The original 10 ACEs were chosen somewhat arbitrarily, and since then, different groups have tried subtracting, modifying, or adding ACEs with varying results. Uh, for example, Roy Wade Jr. in Philadelphia has tested what's now known as the expanded ACEs that may be more relevant to today's kids, like bullying or witnessing neighborhood violence. On the flip side, some of the original ACEs may no longer carry the same burden that they did in the past. New data suggests that parental divorce is not as strongly linked to negative health outcomes now as it was 20 years ago. Not to say that it's not important or uh, consequential, but it's a different uh, parental divorce now is different than it was 40 years ago when the ACE people, uh, when the ACE respondents were were children or were adults. Uh, next, we don't have age-specific guidelines to know whether we should be asking the same ACE questions to parents of both one-year-olds and 17-year-olds. Um, it's hard to imagine that it's exactly the same um, ACE prevalence in those two populations. When do we start asking the child or teen themselves to start answering the screen? Should we start screening for parent ACEs in addition to or instead of child ACEs? These are all great questions, but we just don't have clear answers from the literature. And lastly, even if we did know exactly what to ask and who to ask it to, we don't have a great screening tool that works in a real world busy clinic setting, since most of these studies are done in a controlled research setting. The second argument against ACEs screening is that it may cause more harm than good. So it takes money and time to train staff. It takes a lot of time. And one could argue that those resources could go towards other public health efforts with evidence-based interventions. Um, also, without a great screening tool, there's fear of over-diagnosing or under-diagnosing ACEs, as well as under-treating or over-treating ACEs. Any of these scenarios can lead to significant psychological burden for the families. Next, some parents uh, and patients may feel stigmatized about being asked these questions, which could affect their relationship with their doctor. This actually happened in our clinic a few weeks ago. A parent thought we were racially targeting them with our standard ACE question on parental incarceration. And even though we explained that we asked that question routinely to all families, they were still rather upset about being asked, which is perfectly valid. Uh, screening might place even more burden on our child mental health care system, which is already quite broken. Our current list to see child psychiatry at my hospital is over a year right now, and screening may tip the balance into pure chaos. Finally and importantly, families may be afraid of potential or real Department of Child and Family Services involvement as a result of disclosing an ACE, which may lead to avoidance of preventive visits. So Finkelhorst's third and final argument about, against ACE screening echoes Arvind Garg's earlier quote, which is that screening should not take place until interventions are both accessible and effective. So specific interventions like trauma-informed cognitive behavioral therapy are promising, but right now those are the exception and not the norm. More likely than not, if you refer a child for regular counseling, um, they'll receive generic talk therapy, which might not be effective for a child with high ACEs. Or it might be super effective. The problem is we don't know. Finally, uh, Felitti from the original ACEs study has argued that disclosure in and of itself may be therapeutic for some patients, which is a lovely and comforting thought for us physicians, but this is anecdotal without the rigorous evidence base that is usually required to implement a screening protocol. So in summary, things are a bit of a mess right now. So for our group, however, the state of chaos actually had a silver lining. A number of us healthcare practitioners across four teaching hospitals in Chicago were so confused by the conflicting ACEs screening recommendations that three years ago, we came together to compare screening practices and we decided to create a uniform screening protocol to use in Chicago pediatric clinics. And that was the origin of our collaborative toxic stress research network that inspired our addressing social key or ask questions for health study. So the problem, studies show that pediatricians under-identify toxic stress risk factors, and no studies have examined the feasibility or efficacy of universal toxic stress risk factor screening in the pediatric primary care setting. And we also don't have validated pediatric screening tools that assess both for unmet social needs, things like food, housing, child care, um, and ACEs, and we know that those two uh, uh, divisions are very interrelated. There have been some validated questions for these stressors separately, like the We Care screening for social needs and the SEEK screening for ACEs, but nothing that's a quick and easy to screen for both. So we sought to determine the prevalence of toxic stress with uh, toxic stress risk factors, I should say, with universal screening using the, address, the Ask Questions for Health questionnaire. 
to determine referral rates to community resources before and after implementing ACE ASK screening and to determine feasibility and family acceptance of ASK screening. This was a multi-center study at four academic pediatric primary care clinics in Chicago, the Ann and Robert H. Lawyer Children's Hospital of Chicago, the, Illinois, the University of Illinois at Chicago, Rush University, and the and Cook County Hospital. Our patient population is relatively similar. It's all children who are less than 18 years old with an urban, racially diverse, and low socioeconomic background. And our study took place from August 2016 to February 2017. So there were two parts to our study. One was this clinical initiative, which every single family who walked through the door went through the clinical initiative. Um, this was just a change in how we were practicing medicine and not a research question. So we wanted to identify and address uh, risk factors for toxic stress like ACEs in all children coming for well-child visits. We want to integrate a new, uh, like a novel screening tool for these risk factors. And we wanted to increase referral to community resources based on things we had identified. We also had a research component to this, and our goals were to determine characteristics of children who had a greater chance of having these risk factors. And we wanted to determine if the families found this an acceptable practice. Um, and this is, I think this is a little different. Audrey and I were talking about this a little bit before, but um, a lot of uh, research happens with lots of team members and things like that, but not, not, may not include the perspectives of families. So it was really important to us to make sure that families were giving us feedback and helping us shape the, the way we were screening in clinic. So for this clinical component, members from our four clinic sites formed this multidisciplinary team to develop the ASK questionnaire. And this is a novel 13 item screening tool for unmet social needs and ACEs for children. Uh, social workers from each site developed 13 topic-specific community resource lists that corresponded to each of the 13 questions on the ASK questionnaire. Toxic stress training was provided to all clinicians, social workers, and all staff at all four sites. Protocols were developed for distributing our ASK questionnaires to families, as well as for clinicians assessing, counseling, and referring for ACEs. This is our clinical protocol. So families were to receive the ASK survey upon check-in. If a child uh, less than 18 years old had come for a well-child visit, the, parent was accompanied, the child was accompanied by their parent or legal guardian, and the parent spoke English or Spanish comfortably. Families were asked to complete the questionnaire in the waiting room or in the exam room if they needed more time. The clinicians were to review the ASK results with the family during the well-child visit. For all screens, clinicians were to initial the questionnaire to document that they had actually looked at the screen and identified um, any problems. And for positive screens, clinicians, clinicians were asked to either refu to refer to community resources using the question-specific resource list or to consult our in-house social workers if necessary. I have posted a link here to the ASK website that was developed at UIC by the fantastic social worker, Anthony Hurd, and this is just www.askproject.org. So these are actually Chicago resources for all of the issues that you see on the screen, and feel free to use these resources in your own practices. Uh, we created a two-page ask questionnaire by combining validated questions from the literature. So we looked at uh, surveys that were already tested and approved. We tested those questions with families and we revised them even more based on our families' feedback. So the front page screens for six unmet social needs and was modified from our Vanguard's We Care survey. This looked at things like parental education, parental employment, child care food, uh, bills and housing and legal advice. After marking whether they have a need, families then indicate whether they want help with that need today at a future visit or no help at all. The clinician then documented um, some information at the bottom. The back page screens for six child ACEs that we chose and thought were more uh, prevalent in our population and six parental ACEs in the column on the right. The 13th question assesses for child resilience. And at the bottom, the clinician initials the form and indicates whether referrals were given for each of the 13 questions. This is our research protocol. So when families checked in, they were invited to participate in the research study to evaluate this new questionnaire. If they agreed, the family filled out a demographic form telling us about themselves and their satisfaction with the screening experience. We also surveyed the medical home team at the end of the study about their ask screening experience to see how it felt to do this from um, the point of view of the MAs, the, sorry, the medical assistants, the nurses, the doctors, the social workers, and the point of care front desk staff. We collected data from um, both of these protocols and that it um, included demographics, prevalence of unmet social needs, ACEs, parental ACEs, 
referrals before and after ask implementation and survey information about satisfaction with the screening process. And we did some stats, which I won't go into a ton here for you. So what did we find? And I am gonna say in advance, I'm sorry, I'm not giving any super specific numbers here. Our manuscripts in review, so I can't share the exact numbers, but I did wanna share generally what we found with you. Um, over the six month course, we screened at almost 2,600 families um, with the Ask questionnaire, and that represented a little more than half of eligible well child visits. Most of our patients and families were English speaking, ethnic minorities, and had public insurance. About half of our families had at least one risk factor for, for toxic stress. And I'll talk about what that means. So most of those stressors that they reported were actually unmet social needs. So they were um, disclosing whether they needed help with food or housing or things like that. And what we found was very surprising. Um, very few families disclosed their child ACEs and almost none of the families disclosed their own parental ACEs. Um, Children who were male, African-American, Hispanic, or publicly insured were more likely to repeat at least one of these stressors. We found that about 10% of well-child checkups led to at least one community referral, and the most common referrals we gave were for parental unemployment, housing or bills, and bullying. Community referrals increased more than fivefold after implementing screening at one site where we had data. And most families, uh, which we found very heartening, had a really positive experience with the screening process and wanted the clinic to continue screening and asking these questions. So I'm gonna take a bit of a pause and um, kind of move on to the next part of the talk, which is really what I think is um, the focus for today, which is the lessons learned, um, our experience on how screening worked, how it didn't, and how we can work together with a lot of you out there who already are doing this or who are interested in doing this to make this as, as good as possible for our families. And I'll invite um, Audrey and Stan at any point during this, please um, chip in if you wanna add to anything here. Um, so just to summarize what we found, we found universal screening for ACEs and unmet social needs identified and improved referrals for family needs. Um, we found that parents shared their unmet social needs, but they did not disclose their ACEs, both for their children and themselves. And our ask questionnaire is unsuccessful at identifying ACEs, basically. The screening was acceptable to families and feasible to do in a busy clinic setting. So there were some strengths and limitations to this work. So the strengths, this was a big multi-center design. We had a large sample size. This reflected how things really work in general pediatrics and not in a research setting. Um, we used our questions from the existing questions in the literature, and our implementation protocol uh, was designed with the help of not just physicians, but social workers, statisticians, public health workers, nurses, um, the front desk staff, everyone really gave their um, input to make this a, a smooth process. Our limitations, we didn't have a control group because we wanted to make sure we were screening everyone. Uh, we didn't get every single child who came for a well child visit a survey about a little more than half got them even though we were trying our goal was to get every single patient um, a family a survey and uh, maybe some of the other sites can talk about this a little but this is partially this is real world when you're starting something new it takes a little while for that to come up um, but it also really speaks to the clinic setting it's some places it's um, easier or harder to incorporate new screening tools and surveys into your flow um, and lastly, this data relied on uh, parents self-disclosing or reporting their own ACEs um, and social needs. So there might be some inaccuracy with that as with any self-report data. So Kavita, I just wanted to address two of the things on that last slide. This is Audrey. Um, the first was um, the real world implementation. I, what I wanted to say is um, I think that we um, really had uh, a, a positive design in terms of this being in uh, this study being in an ambulatory clinic. What I want to say also though, that this wasn't a residency clinic, which may or may not reflect um, you know, people's experiences, say, in, you know, a uh, private practice or, you know, a practice that's outside of an academic setting, although we can talk a little bit later if we have time about some examples of that. Um, and then um, in terms of uh, the rates of uh, questionnaire distribution, um, I think that, um, you know, this had even in the best of circumstances, you know, lots to do with, you know, what was happening at any given moment. And I think any time that we're handing out anything, it's never 100%. And so the question is just how close we can get to that. 
Absolutely. Thank you for um, adding those points, Audrey. Those are definitely major issues that we hit along the road, but we, we did as best as we could to get through those, as Audrey mentioned. So I've set up sort of 10 different lessons that we've learned, and these are things that we, we are a, uh, about a 30-member study group, and these are things that over the last year or so we've noted over and over that are really important for us as we're sort of redesigning where we are now and, and helping others start this process. Um, so we'll start with the first lesson. It takes a really long time to set up an ACE screening protocol. So our group first met in April 2015 to discuss screening, and we started actually screening in clinics in July 2016. So it took almost 15 months between when we thought we should do this and when we actually had this handed out in clinics. Um, so there's, you need time. You need time to identify colleagues to spearhead this effort with you. You need time to look into or decide on a screening tool or screening questions. You need to identify community resources that are accessible and affordable and address the things you're screening. You need time to train your entire clinic staff and to incorporate it into the clinic flow. Um, I will mention that um, we actually started in our clinic screening in July, and we actually had to, we considered it a pilot month because it was, there were so many, it was the issues with getting the form to the right place, or people weren't filling it out, or we weren't putting it in the right spot, and all these just logistic things we didn't think of. So it really took us a, like a month of, of constantly reevaluating before we feel like we had a decent flow. So that's normal. If it takes, you can give yourself a two or four week pilot period to to start with some of the screening because you're not gonna it, things will go wrong. And as long as you expect that, you can sort of take it as it goes. Um, lesson two: Choose your team wisely. This is a very time intensive process. Um, and you will hit roadblocks along the way. So choose collaborators who are passionate about the topic, challenge you to think creatively, and are willing to put in the work to help with us. So we came together from four competing in organizations to fulfill one common mission, and we're stronger for that. And I think that's a big strength of our, of our work. And this is especially important if you're doing this work without any additional funding or support like we did. We didn't have any money to, to implement this. This is stuff we were all doing you know, early in the morning or late at night or adding to our day in addition to the things we usually do. Um, and this is not feasible for every clinic setting. We had some, I mean, luckily some of us are in training and have protected time. So some of us have some time to devote to things like this, but um, it is to some extent doable without funding, but we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, can we if I could just jump in for, for that? Just a quick word. I think, I think for choosing your team, um, What's really important is that it's multidisciplinary, that it's not just one type of health pro provider or a team of psychologists or physicians, um, but that there are different voices at the table who can speak into the process of what the screening protocol would look like in, in your clinic specifically. So I just wanted to put that in there that it's really important that the team is from different disciplines um, of healthcare. That is an I, I think that's, point. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Stan. And I also wanted to say, <clears throat> um, although they, they weren't necessarily a part of the team through every step of the way, um, the parents actually were part of the team in terms of both, um, you know, the focus groups to pilot the questionnaire and then later giving us our feedback. So um, we included them as well in an attempt to sort of have this kind of 360 um, project. Absolutely. I think all of us, especially the three of us are physicians and all of us, the first thing well, any of us will tell you is that we cannot do any of this kind of work alone. And we sort of think in a very similar way when we're trying to solve problems. And that is not helpful for these kind of broad, uh, broad issues. So it's really, we benefit from, from everyone in different fields and from our families to help us make sure that we're thinking about this the right way. Um, and so this is a pretty good transition. So lesson three was train everyone in your clinic. So the goal is really to make your whole clinic trauma-informed and to train everyone, the clinicians, the medical assistants, nurses, social workers, front desk staff, security staff, everyone should be trained on ACEs. And the reason is because each person in the clinic team interacts with families in a different capacity. So families, uh, we've actually found some of our families are more comfortable talking about ACEs, not to their physician, but to a medical assistant they've known for a long time. Um, the front desk staff or security guards on the flip side maybe um, are seeing the results of high parental ACEs and need to de-escalate charge situations. Um, and they, it's helpful for them to have a little background on, on why it's happening and how to, how to address that when it's, when it's happening. 
um, on a similar vein, lesson four, retrain regularly. So people may be excited about screening at first, and hopefully they are, but they may forget as time goes on and other things take over their time. Um, so there's a few reasons to retain your staff regularly. One is to identify and address staff concerns early and often. Um, we found that our um, front desk staff was very concerned about the number of surveys we were giving to families, and they felt they saw the families in the waiting room trying to complete all these forms, and they um, they were the first ones to bring up to the we're giving too many at once. So that helped us sort of retrain um, and rethink when are we giving certain surveys and and can we redistribute some of the other ones to make it more doable for families. Uh, retraining regularly helps keep the momentum going um, because there will be competing attentions for everyone's time. And you also want to make sure you're training people who missed your original training. People come and go from the clinic setting and you want to make sure that there's regular opportunities to to refresh on this material. Yeah, if I could just jump in there real quick. I, I think this is a really important lesson too, to retrain because giving, you know, when, when we rolled it out in our health system, we initially provided trainings for all the staff, um, nurses, front desk staff, residents, and everybody was excited at first. And then as time went on, uh, people's enthusiasm. I don't think it was a change in enthusiasm as much as it was other things were prioritized as well. And so I think for the for you know when we talk about our overall screening rates, we're we're a little above 50 percent. I think that if you if you think about that in terms of time, uh, our screening rates in the beginning were very high, and then kind of went down as time progressed. So this issue of retraining um, is essential, and in, in our uh, in, in our health system, we we heard a lot from our house staff, the residents, that as time went on and they had more and more conversations about screens with the families, that they actually felt um, ill-equipped, unequipped, or they they didn't think that they had sufficient training to be able to have conversations meaningful conversations with parents in a short period of time um, about these issues. So one, one thing that we've done in response to that is we've put together a, kind of a pilot curriculum for pediatric house staff in how to address, how to approach conversations of toxic stressors in an ambulatory setting. Um, and we would, have, we would never have known that unless they had mentioned something and retraining wasn't even on our radar when we first started that. So uh, I, I love I love this bit about retraining regularly. Thank you so much for that perspective, Stan. He and Elisa Soli have been doing really great work to have a longitudinal curriculum to train our physicians. And I'm gonna mention these lessons. Some of these things are things that we nailed and did really well. And some of these lessons are things that we didn't do and we wish we had done. And lesson four is absolutely that. We did not retrain as regularly as we really should have. And we felt it as time went on. So we just want to throw this out as a cautionary tale of things that we wish we had done a little better. Lesson five, survey burden is real. I hinted at this a little earlier, but please be cognizant of how many papers you're asking a family to fill out at once, whether that's in a healthcare setting, whether that's in a new school enrollment, whether that's in whatever setting you're working in. Um, we were doing not all the same time, but these are various papers a family could get. ACEs screening, postpartum depression screening, developmental screening, autism screening, teenage depression screening, insurance forms, HIPAA forms, consent forms. Um, it's really hard to give a family seven packets of paper and then, you know, five minutes later, walk them to the exam room and have everything filled out. So if you can, try to stagger out your screening so that parents only have to fill out one to two medical forms per visit. Obviously, you have to fill out the HIPAA and insurance and that kind of stuff, but try to keep the other ones staggered. And this helps both with parents filling out the forms, but it also helps the medical staff. Um, it is hard for them to, to remember, okay, at two years, we do the screening. At three years, we do this. At, for 15-year-olds, we do this. And as, as streamlined and consistent as you can make it, makes it just easier and it helps with your staff buy-in as well. And this was issues, again, this was a uh, do as we say, not as we do sort of situation. We, we sort of figured this out as time went on. And I would, I would add too that just as, as much as it's important to understand that survey burden is real, it, the context in which the survey is given is super important as well. Because if you're, if you're just thinking about, hey, I'm going to implement a screening tool in, in, in our clinic, um, that, that when, when you actually get into the weeds of it, where do you offer the screen? In the waiting room? In the patient room? 
who offers it? Is is is, a, is your MA going to do it? Is the nurse going uh, to uh, approach the screen with the family, um, or are you going to have it on your link to your EHR or your EMR and have it done by the parents privately in the waiting room? So we don't know the answers to to those questions as far as best practices, but there's a you know, and, and I think that's one of the reasons I'm really glad about this webinar because those of you who are listening can start to consider well what what would be the best way to logistically offer this screen for our clinic and, and share that share that with others. So this is a big question of of the context of which the screen is given. That could actually be a really big barrier um, to to or that may have been a big barrier for us as far as why our ACE detection rates were so low um, and an important consideration. Um, so Stan, I think you really nailed that point. Um, we're at, we got a grant recently to start doing semi-structured interviews with families to ask them um, about ACEs disclosure in primary care. And that was a very resounding theme that keeps coming up in the interviews. The families, um, there's not a lot of, you know, the FINTA step tends them, the papers with, along with all the other papers, they're sitting in the waiting room, it's chaos, there's three kids running around, they're trying to fill out forms for each of these three kids. And then all of a sudden there's questions on sexual abuse and they're just like, what is this? This is coming out of nowhere, um, especially if they haven't seen that form in our clinic used before. Um, and it's it's hard. I mean, it's there's it's hard to focus in the waiting room. It's hard to um, watch your kids while you're doing this. There's not really a person sitting down and talking with you and saying, hey, here's why we're asking. We're trying to help. We're not trying to pry. We're not here to get anyone in trouble. We're here to, to help as much as we can. Um, and we don't really have the opportunity to do that. But unfortunately, the waiting room is the best place to give these because once you're in the, the physician's room, usually it goes pretty quickly. So, um, yes, I echo Stan's plea. If anyone else is thinking about doing this in a different way, please do and report back. because we, we have lots of questions on that. And Kavita, I just want to add, you know, the, this part about we were not able to sit down with parents. So even though we had a message to parents at the top of the page saying exactly what you said, we're doing this because we're interested in you, this is confidential, um, we, we just want to support you, that written message did not do the trick at allaying people's concerns. Oh, nobody read it at all. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think it, there is this like in-person framing that is very important. Um, and we haven't, we don't have the answer to this yet. So if someone else does, that would be wonderful. So lesson six, make sure you're managing your positive screens. So it, ideally you have a mechanism in place to know that families who have disclosed ACEs or request help have their concerns addressed. Um, and just to repeat, it's unethical to screen for a problem and not do anything about it. This can cause distress in the medical system. That might be the first time the family ever disclosed that ACE to anyone, and then nobody did anything about it. We didn't care enough to follow up on it. And maybe two days later when we're finishing our clinic notes, we look at the survey and say, oops, they, they needed help with that. That's really not the time to be identifying and addressing these things. So um, it is really important to make sure that if you're going to screen, you have to be able to check every single survey and make sure that you are responding to them as needed. Lesson seven, framing is everything. And this is, maybe I'll skip through this because we sort of talked through this a little bit. The families want to know why you're asking them these very personal questions and they're not reading a little blurb at the top of your survey. Um, we recommend that you emphasize that your screening is routinely done with all patients because you just want to know about things that are related to their child's health. And the point of our screening is to help not to pry. Um, the other thing that's coming up in some of these interviews is that um, parents want to know that the reason you're asking these questions is because you actually want to help and not because you're just checking off your box of all the things you have to do in your preventive visit. They want to feel there's a sense of, of genuineness there. Um, and they also very much want to know what you are going to do with this information. Um, they're very worried that this information um, will end up in the wrong hands. Who's going to see it? Um, is this going in the medical record? Is this going to be reported? So I, that might be some of that conversation that we can't have with them in the waiting room, but it's probably affecting our ACEs disclosures. Yeah, I, I, I want to add there too that that framing is not easy. And we what we learned was we we thought, oh yeah, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll have kind of a script that we'll offer to parents, or we'll we'll have a script that we do in our that we that we say in our trainings when we talk to the the nurses or other staff in the clinic. But this is this is really hard, and, and it has to be very very carefully thought out how you frame the screen 
to your staff and to families because if if they're not if if the purpose of the screen is not aligned between two or more parties uh, it, it will not be effective at all and I think one thing we we learned was that our we had um, the the what our MAs and our nurses were saying to parents were not always aligned with what our house staff and our physicians were saying to our to our parents as well so um, that messaging has to be synchronous and the framing is, is so important so I, I I'm, I'm so glad you put that lesson in here Aretha <laughs> Absolutely, and I should have put consistent framing is everything because yes, it's, if, if everyone's framing the problem differently for families, that might not be advantageous for anyone. Thanks, Dan. You know, I, I actually, I'm going yeah. to add one thing too about Please. that, if that's okay. Um, you Please. know, some, something that I think that we talk and think about a lot too is, um, are we asking the questions for us, in other words, the healthcare practitioners, because we need to know, or were we asking, are we asking the questions as an opportunity for particularly the parents in this case to explore their own history, um, make connections, provide a safe space for them to process. And although, you know, certainly some of the things that we know do help us to make connections and, and support people specifically, but you know, as you mentioned early on, because we don't know, um, you know, the, the perfect ways to intervene always, or those things are emerging, that this, um, that these questions are really an opportunity to have a, a conversation and for parents to think through their own experiences more than they're really, um, you know, uh, the goal is not. Uh, as much for us to know as for them to have that opportunity. Absolutely, and that's such a perfect segue into lesson eight, which is keep asking. So I just want to point out this dichotomy that parents didn't disclose their ACEs in our experience, but they were really happy that we asked the questions. So I was trying, I've been trying to reconcile these two things. Um, and some of the, the information we're getting with parents is, is very informative about why that is. So um, a few themes that have come up recently is that um, parents are saying that they, if they're going to disclose these ACEs um, in their family to any physician, it would actually be the child's pediatrician and not their own adult physician. Um, the reason being they say, well, my most prized uh, thing in my life is my child and I trust my pediatrician with my child. So if I'm going to have, if we're having a problem, then my pediatrician is the person that I trust the most. So there is a space for us to be doing this kind of work and it really points to us needing to tailor exactly how we're doing it and doing it well. Um, what this also points to is that uh, parents, I think some of them like that we are screening, but they're just not ready to just close that this is issues for them. And they might need several opportunities seeing those forms at every child well child visit before they do disclose um, that some of this is affecting them. And this, this universal screening sends a message that your clinic is a place they can turn to if they need help, even if they're okay at the moment. Lesson nine, form partnerships outside of your setting. This is another thing that I wish we had done a little bit better. Um, getting to know the community partners you're referring to. Um, I think one of the issues that came up, we had, we had these amazing resource referral lists put together by our wonderful social workers. And as what happens with a lot of community organization groups over time, some of them stop existing, new ones pop up, the hours change, the contacts change. Um, that's just a normal part of, of that world. So actually having a contact, a go-to person at each organization that you're referring to can be really helpful to make sure that you're staying abreast of all these changes. And maybe it might help kind of sneak your patients in a little sooner too. The last lesson, you do not need money to do this, but it sure could help. So we did this at, as we mentioned, with four institutions with no funding, um, which is doable because some of that time we got was from, from fellowship time and people who had some time to, to do some of these things. Um, but it's really nice if you can get money to do this. So if you had people, you could hire people to ensure that the screens are followed up on, um, help patients navigate through those referrals if they're having trouble accessing those services, and even call families in between clinic visits to check in on how things are going. These are all things that we would love to do a little better, but we it's a little beyond our means. But if you can get some funding to do it, um, that would be quite wonderful. So we have about 10 minutes left in our call. 
Um, I'm going to, I'll just breeze through some of this last part real quick, and I'll, I want to be uh, leaving a good amount of time for some closing announcements um, and for some question and answers. So just a few practical considerations. Think about what you're going to ask for. You don't need to ask about all original 10 ACEs. You can do some of them. You can add some expanded ACEs. Just think about what's common for your population. Um, the other big point is, are you going to ask if the child experienced the ACE, or are you going to ask if they want help with an ACE exposure? Those are two different things, um, and it's probably more important to know whether the family wants help than to know whether something happened at all. Um, it's something a little more actionable and useful. Start small. You don't need to screen for all 10 ACEs at once. You can just start with one or two questions that are relevant. Um, and as you incorporate that into your flow, you can slowly add another question every three to six months or however long you like. Um, and how you're able to do this may depend on your setting. So maybe if you are a two-person private practice in the community setting, you're not going to start screening for 10 things at once. That would be insane. Um, so this should be informed by, by your staff and setting and your, your ability to, to make sure all of these referrals are in place. Um, highlight the strengths of the family. So these are hard conversations, both for the families and for the physicians and for the staff. So trying to end the visits on a positive note by highlighting the family and child strengths um, can really just sort of help with the tone of the visit. And what we know is that parental and social support is the most important protect protective factor against ACEs, against toxic stress. So really trying to find those key people in our families' lives who can help them through this is, is probably the most important thing you can do. Screen everyone. We do not recommend targeted screening based on income, class, race, or anything else because you really never know who's going through these issues. And not everyone who you think is at risk is having problems. So really everyone in your clinic population should be, should be targeted, should be screened. Um, some things we can do in the future, I'm going to skip through some of these, but basically we want to understand if our parents are using the referrals we're providing, and we also want to understand barriers to disclosing ACEs, and we are working on both those things right now. In the long term, we'd like to um, validate that ask survey that we've made. So to those of you who um, saw some of the surveys that I mentioned earlier, we're actually not distributing that for use yet because like I said, it doesn't work on the back and we don't want to distribute something to you that doesn't work. But it is our goal to revise the survey with more parent feedback to, include, to improve ACEs disclosure, conduct a big validation study to make sure it works in different settings, and we will absolutely let you know when that's ready to share with, with the world at large. That is our goal. And really, if any of you out there are interested in research in this area, we know we have prevalence data, we have outcomes data for ACEs. What we need to know is how do we target, the, how do we identify these problems with good screening tools, and how do we treat this the most effectively? That's really where the research needs are. Um, and part of this is people need to know what ACEs are for us to have um, effective treatment models for ACEs. So all of the work that, um, that this group is doing, that all of you are doing to educate people about what ACEs are and how it impacts our families are part of the solution. We can't do this alone. So this, um, the impact of ACEs are across all these different settings uh, listed here, and we really need to work together to bring our own individual um, strengths together to really build our trauma-informed communities. Um, if you are interested in specifically teacher pediatrician partnerships, I wrote about this recently, and you can check that out. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was a teacher, so um, I do have some thoughts on how we can start the conversations there. There are very early conversations. There is nothing hard in place, but um, maybe some of you out there can help me with that. So this is all of the people who went into all of the things that we talked about today. Um, thanks to everyone here, especially to our families and clinics who, who really... Um, who really supported and provided great feedback. A few references if you would like some reading. And thank you so much. And we'd like to thank the Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative for inviting us here today and for the wonderful work they do every day to help spread the word on ACEs. On behalf of Audrey and Stan, a very special thanks to all of you who joined us on the call. I think there's more than 100 of you, which is awesome. Um, and we hope we shared something useful with you today to spark more conversation on this topic. Our contact information is here in case you'd like to continue this dialogue over email. And at this time, we'd be happy to um, turn this over for closing announcements and any questions or comments. Thanks to all.
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this is Lara again from Health and Medicine Policy Research Group. Uh, this was so fascinating and so much amazing information in here. And the questions that we are getting are people are so engaged and have lots of questions. So I'll um, jump into <laughs> a few um, that uh, one of the ones that people have asked kind of in a, a couple different ways is just um, thoughts on ACEs not being reported as high as uh, one would expect. And you have shared some things about why, like maybe the setting in which you gave the assessment, like in the waiting room, wasn't um, conducive to that. Um, but is there anything, are there any other thoughts that you have about that? Um, do you think there were language barriers? Do you think um, anything along those lines? Oh, I have lots of thoughts. I've talked a ton, so I'll, I'll give first pass to Audrey and Stan. You know, I, I want to mention just a couple of things. I want to reiterate um, people's fear that they will be reported to agencies that will come and, you know, disrupt their family as opposed to supporting them. I, I think that that is a real concern. And then something that we didn't talk so much about, but I just want to plant the seed on this is, People, one of the responses to trauma is to dissociate from it. And so sometimes when we bring these things up, people literally don't remember or they don't have language to tell us about what happened. And so that may be some of the piece of why there's underreporting. Uh, I would add to that um, a lot of, I don't know the exact average age of all the patients in, across all four sites in, in our study. Uh, but we, you know, at, at least at, at Cook County, we had a fair number of infants and toddlers. And so the under detection may just reflect an age bias that they weren't old enough and ACEs had not occurred to, to mirror national averages. And, and the other part to that, too, is that like the original ACEs study and, and several reports like the BRFSS, where we get a lot of our prevalence data from, um, are retrospective in nature. So they're asking adults to report on ACEs that happen obviously in their youth or adolescence. Uh, and whereas we were trying to identify ACEs as, as proximal to their occurrence as possible in these children, uh, we offered the screen at every single well visit. So imagine if that's you know an infant that's two, four, six, nine, 12 months uh, where the parent is getting the screen uh, theoretically. So there, um, I think there are a lot of reasons why there is under detection. The, the last thing I would say too is that I, I as far as I know, um, there's kind of two camps of, P, of, of groups when they ask and approach this issue of screening. So there's one side they're asking adults about ACE, their, their history of ACEs in their youth, the parents, and then there's the other side where they're asking uh, parents to answer on behalf of their children. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we're going to see differences in detection rates or, or the prevalence of ACEs based on who you're asking about. Absolutely. Those are all very good points. I'm going to add two to those um, before we get to the next question. So one is there's something called social acceptability bias, um, which may play out. Um, people may see their physician as someone where they want to tell um, the right answer to. They don't want their physician to look at them in a different way or treat them differently, so they might not want to report some of these things. And uh, sort of related to that, um, there, you know, these telephone surveys where we have probably more accurate data in ACEs prevalences, there's no consequence. There's an anonymous survey. Someone calls you up over the phone. They ask you some questions. You say yes or no. You hang up the phone. It's very different from walking into your child's clinic that you go into every two months because you have an infant seeing the same people over and over um, and wondering, well, what if I, are they going to take my baby away? Are they going to um, tell someone else? Are they going, I have to get going. I can't tell them this today. So it's, it's a very different setting. Um, not to say that one is better than the other, but I think we're getting different information and have different opportunities in, in a telephone survey research versus in the clinic. Great. Excuse me. Thank you so much. And we are right at 10 o'clock, um, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. And uh, the presenters have kindly given their contact information, so uh, you can follow up with any other specific questions, um, unless any of the panelists want to say anything else before we close out. Do you all have any last comments? Just thank you oh. to everyone. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you.
on behalf of the collaborative in health and medicine because this has been so fascinating and there's this is such an exciting project and there's so much information I think for everyone um, to take back with them to um, their respective places of work. Um, so we will follow up with um, a copy of the slides as a few people have asked um, and there will be a recording of the webinar and uh, we'll send an email with contact information as well as links to our website um, and a survey. So thank you all so much. We appreciate your time and have a great day. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.